This video is about the different life history stages of one species of Scyphozoan, Aurelia aurita. The life history of this species looks something like this. A medusa produces gametes, which when fertilized develop into planula larvae. Those eventually metamorphose into polyps, which are called Scyphistomy in Scyphozoans. Scyphistomy reproduce asexually to make more Scyphistomy. Sometimes they reproduce asexually in a different way, called strobilation, to make a fiery, which are juvenile medusae. Those grow to make adults. So we'll start with planulae. Where do we get them? This diagram's a little misleading, so part B in the diagram implies that adult Aurelia release eggs and sperm into the water, what we would call free spawning. But actually what happens is that males release sperm into the water. Females capture the sperm and it enters their gastrovascular cavity and that's where eggs are fertilized. Soon after eggs get fertilized, zygotes or embryos, I'm not quite clear about that, are moved to the base of the oral arms where they're brooded until they become planulae and then they get released into the water. So where can we get planulae? From the bases of the oral arms of brooding females. Here's a brooding female. The bright white edges of the oral arms are where there are concentrations of planulae. I got planulae and all other life history stages from the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium Jelly Lab shown here. Thanks to curator Dr. Andres Carrillo for providing all of those. Dr. Carrillo flipped this brooding female over so that her oral side was up, and then he collected planulae from the edges of the oral arms just using a glass pipette. This process didn't harm the female, she just went back into the general population of adult jellies at the aquarium. I added a few microliters of 1% acetic acid to this slide right now. You can see the planula reacting in an interesting way. Planulae settle to a hard substrate and metamorphose into polyps, called Scyphistomy. Cabrillo grows those polyps on plastic plates that they hang into small tanks of running seawater. Just so you know how I'm doing this, here's the setup I'm using for filming Scyphistomy and lots of other things on a dissection microscope.
With a good view from the oral surface, you can see that these polyps are a little bit more complex in structure than they initially appear. This is what the Skyphistomy are eating, larvae of the brain shrimp Artemia. We'll see lots more of these in this class.
To see why the branch ramp larvae stick to the tentacles of Skyphistomy, we need a closer look at those tentacles. So to get such a closer look, I took a Skyphistoma from the dish, put it on a glass slide, and squished it with a cover slip. We can then move it to a compound microscope. You can see four tentacles here. When conditions are right, Scyphistomies strobilate. That is, they produce tiny juvenile medusae called a fiery. Sometimes people call a strobilating Scyphistoma a strobola. Here is a strobola. Eventually, a fiery are released. These individuals were released a few days ago.
Remember swimming by a fiery? To understand how they're doing that, it would help to know where they have muscles, or really concentrations of the contractile parts of epitheliomuscular cells. An easy way of visualizing those, which I'll just call muscles here even though they're technically not muscles, is to mark them with a fluorescent label, which I did with some of these fiery. Here's how I did that. Fluorescently labeling muscle, or really filamentous actin, which is a major component of muscle in animals, is pretty straightforward. So what you need to do first is to relax the animal, or basically prevent its muscles from contracting. I use 7.5% magnesium chloride mixed one-to-one -one with seawater. Then you fix the animal, so you stabilize the tissues in some ways, uh, some way, often using aldehydes, uh, which cross-link proteins. So what I did was incubate a fiery in a, a dilute solution of paraformaldehyde in seawater for about two hours. You rinse it in some buffer to get rid of excess um, aldehyde. So I used PBS, which is a very standard um, buffer solution, phosphate buffered saline. Then you need to break open the cell membranes to allow your label a chance to get in to label the molecule that you're interested in, filamentous actin in this case. So you need to permeabilize those cell membranes. So what I did was use PBS with a little bit of detergent, Triton X, um, and that's usually called PBT, and that uh, breaks open those lipid bilayers uh, so the label can get into the cells. So then I added some label, and that label I used was phalacidin. So phalacidin is a fungal toxin that binds specifically to F-actin. Uh, you've probably heard of phalloidin. This is just a, a variant of it, also a natural fungal toxin. Uh, the label, of course, is not fluorescent itself. Um, so it's not useful unless it's bound, it's linked to a fluorophore. And you can get these linked to any number of fluorophores that are excited by different wavelengths of light and emit different wavelengths of light. I used one called BDPFL. Um, so I incubated the ephyre in a solution of phalacidin BDPFL uh, conjugate in PBT for about an hour or so. And then you rinse it in PBS to get rid of excess label. And then I just viewed it. So there is a step 6.5 here that you have to use for most animals, actually, because most animals are kind of opaque. Um, and so you need to make them transparent, more or less, so that excitation light can get to the label and emitted light can get out to your eyes. For a fiery, they're pretty translucent, right? Um, so I didn't need to do that. And also, the epitheliomuscular cells are just in a layer right on the outside of the animal. So excitation light doesn't have to travel through much tissue, and emitted light doesn't have to travel through much tissue. So I skipped that step in this case. All right, so here is just a normal upright compound microscope um, equipped for both bright field and for uh, epifluorescent illumination. And you guys are really familiar with bright field. You turn the microscope on and light comes from the bottom. It passes through your specimen and as it's passing through, some of it's scattered, some of it's absorbed. What uh, goes through is collected by that objective lens right above your specimen and then directed to your eyes or to a camera. In epifluorescence microscopy, um, what typically happens is that light is usually produced by a mercury lamp, and that generates um, a light of a really broad spectrum of wavelengths, uh, and that's directed towards the specimen. But before it gets there, it passes through a filter, and that filter lets light of um, only the right wavelengths through. Um, it blocks out light that's not necessary, and so for BDPFL, that happens to be blue light. Um, and then that hits a uh, mirror that's oriented at 45 degrees and uh, passes down through the objective to your specimen. Once that blue light hits your specimen, if there's fluorophore present in your specimen in some particular pattern, like where there's filamentous actin, for example, in this case, um, that fluorophore absorbs the blue light and then it fluoresces. And remember, that just means emitting light of a slightly longer wavelength. Um, in this case, it's green for bit of EFL. That light is actually emitted in all directions, but light that's uh, uh, photons that are headed up are uh, collected by that objective lens and then uh, directed to your eyes or to a camera by a series of mirrors. Those ephyrae grow into adult medusae, which have a different shape than the ephyrae do. These individuals are very young. They have the adult body form, but they're not yet reproductive.
I wanted to see how much mesoglea there was in these medusae and also to see where the GVC and radial canals were relative to that mesoglea. So I relaxed a medusa, killed it in formaldehyde, and I cut it roughly along these dotted lines. Then I turned the middle slice on its side so now we can look at a section of this animal perpendicular to the oral aboral axis. Here I put the tips of the forceps in the main gastrovascular cavity, then move them along the radial canals to the left and the right. You can also see where the radial canals are when I tip the section up or down. This preparation also let me look a little more closely at the structure of the oral arms.